thanks, Griff. So, uh, yeah, I'm Jeff Myers, CIO of Kobe Capital Management. Uh, pleased to be here today with Ralph Clark, who's the CEO of Sound Thinking. Um, I'm going to let Ralph, you know, describe the business, but I'll, I'll just give you the valuation perspective. So basically, it's a, a SaaS business trading at about 1.4 times revenue and eight times this year's EBITDA. And the company guidance for EBITDA this year was 18 to 20 percent. And uh, we think that it could possibly double as a percentage over time, given the operating leverage in the business. Um, and we think it's a it's a it's a great business. So we're we're pretty excited about it. So Ralph, maybe you could uh, just start out talking about um, you know uh, Shotspotter. Uh, maybe you know kind of what percent of your business is Shotspotter. Talk about maybe the technology that you guys have. And um, you know the market you serve, and you know what you see the potential there being. Great. Well, first of all, thank you very much uh, for having me, and uh, thank you all for uh, joining this call to learn a little bit more about the sound thinking uh, story. Um, you know, as a lot of you maybe know, uh, we started this business as a shot spotter, which is a leading acoustic uh, gunshot detection uh, technology that was invented by our founder, Dr. Bob Schoen. Uh, well over 20 uh, years ago. This is a category that we've essentially uh, created and own uh, to, this, uh, to this day. Um, there's just about over $60 million of uh, revenue that comes from our ShotSpotter brand. And this is, the, this is the technology that allows us to detect, locate, and alert on instances of outdoor gunfire with a high degree of uh, reliability and speed. And the reason this is so critically important uh, to the uh, public uh, safety uh, agencies that utilize this service, which is now well over 170 uh, cities and police departments that use it, is that 80 to 90 percent of gun, gunfire, criminal gunfire, goes unreported by a traditional 911, which is just an alarming uh, statistic. And what that means is guns are fired, people have given up, they don't call 911, which means there's no response uh, to these incidents, which are lost opportunities to potentially save lives, recover physical forensic evidence, um, interview witnesses, but most importantly, show a community that uh, their uh, protection is a priority to the police department. So it goes a long way in terms of enhancing uh, law enforcement uh, legitimacy. Uh, the way we bring about that service is through the deployment of sensors. We'll deploy typically 20 to 25 sensors per square mile uh, we'll uh, deploy these in a, a defined coverage area where typically most of the gunfire activity is happening. And when a gun is fired out, that sound will emanate out and our technology is able to detect and timestamp that. And when multiple sensors are able to do that, and this is a core of our intellectual property using multiple sensors to define an incident and accurately locate it, uh, we're able to use a time differential to accomplish that again very quickly and then go through some machine uh, filtering process to knock down noises of things that aren't uh, gunfire and then bring everything else into what we describe as an incident review center where they'll do the final adjudication of that particular event being a gunshot or not. And we're uh, committed to do this uh, contractually in less than 60 seconds, but most of the time we're doing it within 30 to 45 seconds. So it's a real game changer uh, frankly, in some of these uh, communities that are really um, uh, besieged uh, by gun violence. Uh, we charge approximately $70,000 per square mile per year. This is an enormously uh, sticky um, uh, solution. And if I were to, I was going to share a slide with you, but I think there's like three KPIs that are critically important that I think really differentiate our business. And the first one kind of starts with our NPS score. So we've been able to have world-class NPS over the years, last year it was 64, which, you know, dealing with police departments, if you can get an NPS score, net promoter score of 64 with the critical uh, elements of police departments, they're pretty persnickety. That's pretty impressive. And then what that does, it yields to a uh, very low CAC. Uh, we're basically investing 52 cents to create a dollar's worth of ACV. And at the same time, uh, we have retention rate. Um, our gross retention rate is like 99 percent plus. So when you put those two things together, starting with NPS and our passion around NPS and making sure that customers are valuing the service, 
you know, it um, drives down the CAC because now those customers become referenceable customers and effectively your most um, critical salespeople, frankly, in getting to other new locations and the longevity, the LTV uh, works out pretty well. In fact, when people ask me, what is the LTV, a shot spotter? I have to say, honestly, I don't know because we're still computing it. We still have a number of customers that have been with us over 15, uh, 20 plus years. So that's the way we think about that business. That's our core solution. But we've always had the view that we want to be impactful beyond acoustic gunshot detection and really be a, uh, I'll call it a problem solver for uh, public safety uh, agencies. And as we're working with a number of these agents, we, agencies, we saw other opportunities to expand our uh, capabilities beyond acoustic gunshot detection to things like patrol management, investigative case management solutions, and also uh, search capability, which I'll talk a little bit about later. That's our crime tracer uh, solution. And then most recently, uh, we did what might appear to be a little bit of outside the swim lane acquisition of a weapons detection technology solution called SafePoint, but there's a lot of similarities there. I'm really happy to talk a little bit uh, about later, but all in all, this is a fantastic uh, business. Uh, it has now multiple uh, growth drivers from not only ShotSpotter, but we've diversified to these other solutions. They're also bringing other buying centers to bear. Before, just with ShotSpotter, our buying centers were pretty much concentrated with local law enforcement agencies. But as we've expanded to some of these other adjacent solutions, the buying centers have uh, now, they're now including kind of state level agencies. For example, we've closed a couple of deals, a case management deals, case builder deals with some state uh, agencies. Um, same is true for Crime Tracer with both Tennessee and Massachusetts. These were seven figure deals. And then um, with SafePoint, that's 100% commercial. Although the intersectionality with SafePoint, which was kind of interesting when we did the due diligence around this acquisition, was that uh, when we were talking to folks that were in the buying center of these um, uh, hospitals and uh, casinos and the like, these directors of security, uh, guess what their uh, uh, um, employment uh, had been with traditionally? They were law enforcement. So they're familiar with shot spotters. So they kind of come over and are already uh, positively inclined toward the kind of sound thinking slash shot spotter uh, brand reputation that comes from our very high NPS. So I said a lot there, so I'll, I'll hit the pause button and hopefully I answered some of your question there, no, Jeffrey. You, yeah, you definitely did, you definitely did. Um, maybe you talk a little bit about uh, Case Builder and the deal you won with the New York uh, prison systems and, and, you know, are any opportunities, you know, you're seeing beyond that, you know, based on that, uh, on that win. Thank, thanks for asking that question. I think this reminds me, frankly, of the um, shot spotter deal we did with NYPD, who had been a skeptic of acoustic gunshot detection for many, many years. They gave us a shot to prove what we could do. And we proved it. And again, NYPD is a very persnickety very, very tough agency to deal with. They have very, very high standards. But once we could prove that we could step up to their expectations of quality and capability, that really broke open the market for us because people looked at it and said they pay attention and says, well, hey, if NYPD likes this stuff, this is something we have to pay attention to. I would almost say the same thing is true for our uh, DOC project which is basically an $18 million project for our case builder solution. It's going to help the Department of Corrections of uh, New York City be a lot more compliant. You probably, some of you maybe have been reading in the press about they're always on the verge of being potentially taken over by the feds, which is not where you want to go. And so how they can make um, uh, accelerated uh, traction on being more compliant and showing their compliance to uh, these various regulations and the like, like, you know, prison, uh, you know, rape act and things like that is critically important. And so we're helping them accomplish that with uh, case case builder. Um, and I think maybe I mentioned so it's 18 million dollars um, over um, 18 million dollars over six years. So um, it's uh, three million dollars a year. Some of it is professional services and then some of it is maintenance. And then some of it is just ongoing uh, um, support for SAS, SAS recurring revenue basis. And we think we can deepen that as we add more users. Uh, for those of you who have followed the story, the very frustrating story, we were talking about 
um, NYC DOC for a very long time. And we have kept having to push the deal out because it kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, so that was a little bit of the uh, juxtaposition that we had there. But now it's all done. We're making a lot of good progress there in uh, bringing that application to bear and have already uh, landed another uh, Department of Corrections uh, company that I, I'm not sure I can talk about just yet, but we'll be hopefully talking about it on uh, in the near in the very near future where there's another DOC and it was all spinning off of NY uh, DOC. So that's a pretty interesting market. And then we've talked about um, another case builder deal, not in the DOC area, but this is a state AG uh, agency that's doing Medicare fraud investigations. And this is with a very, very large state. And we have the opportunity to get going there and expand beyond um, uh, this particular use case with a number of users to other users as well. So we're pretty, we're pretty excited about it because again, this doesn't put us uh, front and center with uh, city negotiations that we've been dealing with with ShotSpotter. We love the fact that we're diversifying our buying centers. Got it. What, um, maybe just going back to ShotSpotter for a second. So what, what do you think the penetration is like in the U.S. and also maybe talk about you know, a uh, foreign, uh, uh, the opportunity outside of the U.S.? Yeah, great question. So let me um, uh, break apart kind of shot spotter in uh, three uh, buckets, if I might. So there is the, I'll call it domestic law enforcement uh, bucket, uh, which is we're mostly known for. Those are the 170 or so customers that I spoke, uh, spoke about. We have over 1,100 square miles that are deployed out there uh, with uh, domestic local law enforcement agencies. Then there's another adjacent uh, area that we're getting some really good traction in. I'll call it security deployment. So this isn't with local law enforcement, but these are with kind of private entities and also universities. So I think we're deployed in probably about 12 or so uh, universities where we have a, I'll call it a microdome of support. So this isn't like deploying, you know, 20 square miles or 10 square miles. It might be three square miles or something like that that covers the campus and then a few blocks off of the campus to protect the students, faculty, and uh, the like uh, there from the rare, but sometimes unfortunately, uh, incidents of gun violence that occurs there. And then uh, there is, I'll call it the commercial security deployment, uh, where we're now beginning to see some really uh, interesting traction. We're deployed in a, um, a large, uh, manufacturer of things where the, it's a, they don't want to be named, but I will just say it's a very colorful CEO. And um, we're deployed in a couple of his, uh, his um, uh, manufacturing plants. Um, and so that's pr pretty exciting. We're deployed in a couple of logistics uh, companies as well. Um, not naming the names, but you know, you think of logistic companies as like UPS, FedEx, or whatever. You can pick the ones or whatever. I'm not saying which one it is exactly, but those are pretty interesting opportunities. And now we have another specific initiative that we're working on to go get after the um, substation utility market. So, are, are any of you familiar with the fact that they've had some substation attacks as a way to kind of take down the electrical grid? And the way those happen is people kind of shoot at these um, these substations and they cause the oil leakage. And before they know it, um, it basically disintegrates or whatever if they hit the right thing. So being able to be notified of someone firing at your substation is critically important to protecting the electrical grid. And it has some FERC regulations associated with it as well. So we're looking at trying to uh, tweak our core technology to make it be more like a, um, you know, I'll call it traditional shot spotter is broad area acoustic gunshot detection where we're concerned about, you know, gunfire happening anywhere in our coverage area. This is a little bit different where we're doing perimeter based gunshot detection, where we're looking for weapons to be fired into a specific location. Um, so that's really, really, really quite exciting. And that's a global opportunity as well. You could see us protecting uh, DODEA schools, Department of Defense educational schools that are uh, global uh, outside of the U.S. from potential uh, terrorist threats, maybe even embassies or whatever, where you want to be quickly notified of any uh, gunfire coming into or at an embassy. So it's a pretty it's a pretty exciting market for us. So I think um, acoustic gunshot detection for us has a lot of leg room. I think we're really in the, the third inning 
of this uh, uh, particular um, prosecution of this business. And the good news is like, we're kind of the player. We're the leader in the space. There's no real direct competition whatsoever. We've got over 30 issued patents in this area. We have, you know, like well over 20 years experience doing this with the brand reputation that goes along with it. So this is our, this is our market basically to own. Right. Great. M maybe, uh, Ralph, you want to talk a little bit about uh, Chicago and maybe give a, a little history there and, you know, kind of where we are today with, you know, what some of the aldermen were, uh, you know, getting through city council and, um, yeah, maybe just talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so Chicago. Um, so we've been a long-term uh, partner with Chicago PD through multiple mayors, uh, multiple superintendents. Um, Chicago uh, is our largest domestic um, acoustic sh gunshot deployment. They're not our largest revenue customer. New York City is that, but uh, Chicago is the largest um, shot spotter deployment at 120 square miles. Uh, right now, we're contracted to uh, get paid through and delivering service through uh, September with a uh, November, uh, I'll call it kind of transition, true, true end date. Um, and that's what we know so far. Um, as you pointed out, the aldermen have, in a very unprecedented way, have banded together to say, we don't want that to happen. We're going to take the control away from the mayor. Uh, and want to put it in the hands of the city council, which interestingly enough, most people don't realize this, but uh, although Chicago operates as a strong mayor system, if you look under the covers, governance wise, it's a weak mayor system. And that's really important uh, to note. Uh, it's not a strong mayor system, although with dailies and and the other uh, mayors have been Rahm Emanuel, certainly uh, <laughs> It, they, they've operated as a strong mayor type of system, but governance wise, uh, charter wise, they're a weak mayor system. So the council has put forward an order just basically to push back on him wanting to uh, not go forward with shot spotter beyond this contracted period. You know, legally, you know, we don't know where this thing is all going to sort out. I, to me, I handicap this is they, they can't legally make him do that um there's too many things that he can do to frustrate that effort in my humble opinion i think it's going to have to reach some kind of political conclusion potentially so the way i think about chicago is um we've taken it out of our uh, kind of our expected arr for 2025 and just treat it as upside um i i believe worst 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 case scenario uh we're we're back in chicago by the end of Brandon Johnson's uh, term. There's no question about that. Gotcha. So maybe, maybe we're just out for a couple of years. And there might be the case where he has to blink because at the end of the day, when they move into the budget negotiations in November, he might want something for the Chicago Teachers Union that the Black Caucus is going to hold up in the budgetary process unless they get what they want. And so there's might be potentially a little bit of horse trading where he might have an opportunity to, you know, retreat but we're not counting on it maybe uh Brett, yeah maybe you could talk a little bit about you know arr growth where it, where it's been historically and i remember I, I was at the analyst day and um you know you guys talked about sort of pulling chicago out of that and still growing arr at like a five percent rate maybe you can talk about kind of the puts and takes to <laughs> ARR for um you know, for next year where, where potential upsides could be or potential downsides could be. Sure. Yeah. So let me go back to my notes. Um, and so for, uh, for 2023, we kind of entered uh, 2024 with uh, 95.4 million dollars of ARR. Uh, we think after all the puts and takes of, you know, subtracting out, you know, we start with 95.4, we take out 8.2 for Chicago. We're also going to take out another 2.6 for Puerto Rico, which has the possibility of actually coming back. And then there's just another million dollars of kind of traditional attrition we might expect to see over a million dollars, uh, excuse me, you know, at, at a million dollars with a hundred million dollar business. So that's kind of that 1% attrition. But then offsetting that is like $8 million of new uh, miles 
uh, five million dollars of safe point, a million dollars of case builder, a million dollars of uh, international, uh, half a million of crime tracer, and then a half million dollars for DOC incremental ARR, and then uh, price increases, which we've been pretty successful in executing toward. And then uh, resource router, we have at 300,000. And that kind of lands us to estimate it. I want to say I, I wasn't able to put up my uh, disclaimer, uh, cautionary note regarding forward looking statements, but just imagine that you saw that as I'm talking about this, please. Uh, that puts us at about 100, a little bit north of $100 million. Now, going into 2025. So that's without Chicago, without Puerto Rico, a million dollars of attrition, and then all the other green ads that I spoke about. I will say that um, there's a couple things that are running ahead of schedule. Um, so Resource Router definitely ahead of schedule. Crime Tracer ahead of schedule. Uh, I think international, there's some really interesting things internationally that are, um, that are coming about that I'm pretty encouraged with. So we're feeling pretty good that uh, we can enter 2025 with over $100 million of ARR. And then on top of that, of course, we have some amount of professional services business that um, we uh, generate through our technologic division working with NYPD on their kind of core ERP systems, which is generated anywhere from, you know, uh, four to six million dollars. And then there'll probably be like another two to three million dollars of professional services associated with um, uh, uh, NYC DOC. Got it. All right. Great. Maybe, um, Ralph, you talk a little bit about the safe point acquisition, um, you know, the, the t target market there, the, you know, competition, I guess, how, how you guys are differentiated from from the competition and, you know, what you're seeing so far there. Yeah. Well, thanks again for that question. So uh, SafePoint is a weapons detection space, uh, weapons detection uh, technology. So think of it as a very sophisticated uh, metal detector. But what's unique and very different about SafePoint versus any other solution is that it's completely uh, covert. So you don't know, uh, and Evolve is probably the biggest deal in town there. You, many of you maybe have walked through an Evolve uh, system where you're going through a metal detector. It's a smart metal detector, that's to be sure, but you know you're going through a metal detector. So 100% screening, okay? And the idea is that their screening process is a lot faster than a traditional, maybe dumbed down metal detector, but you are getting screened and they do generate false positives. Sometimes you gotta pull the laptop over your head or whatever to kind of go through the building. So it kind of slows things down. Um, so our approach is fundamentally different. Um, our system is uh, very um, low profile. You walk past these ballers, they don't look like anything. They almost look like a, uh, a tall, almost kind of like an ashtray or garbage can in effect. These aluminum type of things, you walk by them and we're using passive sensors, not active sensors, um, uh, using a physics principle called magnetic moment in uh, time. Uh, magnetic moment motion, I say. Um, and what it's doing is when a gun passes by, it will create a unique uh, signature based on the magnetic orientation of the gun and the speed at which the gun is moving through these uh, bollards, which basically have magnets in them that have an XYZ coordinate. We're combining it with a, a 3D camera so we can get very precise time and movement of the person moving through. So we're capturing a lot of data, very similar to ShotSpotter in a way, and we're putting it into a mosaic tile and then running some uh, very sophisticated uh, machine learning neural network stuff to be able to uh, reduce false positives and uh, reduce uh, false negatives. Um, this works perfectly in places that um, don't wanna slow down traffic, but they do have a security obligation to protect their uh, guests and or employees. Um, so places we're not interested in um, kind of competing, if you will, we don't wanna be in stadiums. Um, stadiums for Evolve, because you want people to know they're going through a metal detector because that sets up a certain deterrent effect. Hospitals, casinos, uh, high-end investment banks, on the other hand, they don't want to have their customers, if you're you know, Goldman Sachs or something like that, you don't want your PCS clients 
to, you know, you know, suffer going through a metal detector, even a fancy metal detector, but you have an obligation for security. And that's why a solution like ours fits very well. Same thing for casinos. I'm paying $500 a night of room for a casino. I'm not going to go through a metal detector. You got to make it very easy for me to have ingress and egress out of the thing. But at the same time, you got to check the box for security. So we're perfect for that. So we're we're limiting our focus to um, hospitals, uh, casinos, and um, certain very high-end uh, commercial A properties with, you know, kind of brand name institutions where, again, they don't want to subject their uh, guests and clients and employees walking through uh, a metal detector. And there's a lot of IP around this. And I think, if I may, can I just talk about the origin story sure. here? Because sure. I think it's really interesting because it reminds me a lot of the origin story of um, ShotSpotter in terms of how Dr. Bob found his way to ShotSpotter because he didn't start out with ShotSpotter. He started out looking at uh, using uh, time of arrival analysis to figure out the locations of earthquakes. Um, and so then he took that idea and says, hey, well, if I could do it for earthquakes, if I can somehow capture time of arrival from multiple sensor points on the impulse of noise of gunshot, I can do the same thing. And in the, in the case of these guys at SafePoint, the original founding team of SafePoint, they came out of the military background where they were basically doing forward operating base stuff where they had to have a very covert means of being able to detect weapons and people moving through the area so you know they they could better protect those forward operating bases so they were in harsh conditions they were uh they didn't have a lot of resources uh it had to work obviously because you know you're protecting uh you know u.s troops and the like and they had the idea that hey look we can apply the same thing put a little bit more spit and polish on it we can maybe do the same thing commercially where a covert means of detecting weapons again, using this uh, magnetic moment in motion principle is something that is, uh, is feasible. Um, and so that's how, they, that's how they started. Now, we've had to do a lot of work with them to, because um, their idea is brilliant. Uh, we've got some patent stuff already kind of going uh, in that regard. Uh, but now it has to get to a place that um, meets the, I'll call it the sound thinking standard, and it has to be scalable too. So we want a scalable solution that we can really blow out and make it big because this is a market that can go really, really big very, very quickly. And we just use Evolve as a proxy uh, for that. So we're really, really, really quite excited. It's a competitive market, but the TAM is a $20 billion TAM, we estimate. So uh, it's pretty exciting. How many how many salespeople do you have so far for SafePoint? And you know what sort of quotas do they have? And how are you looking to grow the sales force? Yeah, great question. So uh, right now uh, we have uh, four four dedicated uh, sales directors exclusively focused on SafePoint, all reporting to a, a VP. Uh, we just basically uh, replaced the VP that was there, um, but so we we assigned it to a new VP uh, now. Uh, the total collective quota for that team is uh, five million dollars of booked ARR by the end of this year. Um, what we have seen is the pipeline has grown immensely, uh, but we're you know, still not seeing the acceleration on the cell piece that I think we, we would wanna see. So that's been a bit of a challenge. So we're trying to dig underneath that and understand how we can uh, accelerate that more. Now I know part of it is like we're being very careful and not trying to get over our ski tips. Um, some of you might be familiar with the uh, Evolve uh, travails where they got over their ski tips and over committed to things and didn't deliver on it. Now they got an FTC investigation. So we're trying to avoid that kind of stuff at all cost. Um, the other thing that we're doing that has added some uh, time to our, uh, I'll call it a GA product that's um, embraced by the hospital community is uh, getting HIPAA compliance which will be a competitive weapon once we get it. But um, that's the other thing we're working on, and that should be delivered um, in the next few months. Gotcha. Sounds good. So how about, um, I guess, where you are today, P&L-wise, you know, maybe 60% gross margins, 18 to 20% EBITDA margins. 
you know, where do you think that can go over time and where do you see the operating leverage, you know, in the business? Yeah. So I think the operating leverage, uh, first it starts with revenue growth. As we uh, drive incremental dollars uh, uh, to the company, a disproportionate amount of that uh, money uh, flows all the way down to adjusted EBITDA. Our COGS for the most part is semi-fixed. So as we grow revenue, we don't have to add uh, at the same uh, rate uh, as we do with revenue with COGS expansion. So that's, that's pretty, that's pretty uh, encouraging. So th it starts with revenue growth and then there's operating leverage on COGS because COGS is semi-fixed. And then there's operating leverage below the line with sales and marketing, G&A and, uh, and R&D. Um, if you think about it, uh, our R&D for ShotSpotter is kind of one and done. I mean, we've, we've invented that, we've built it it's it's done. I mean, what we what we had to do five, 10 years ago, we're not having to do that right now. Um, we're investing more in case builder. We're investing more in crime tracer. And um, uh, um, I said case builder. I'm sorry, resource router. Uh, and we're certainly investing a lot in uh, safe point. But even those investments aren't at increasing at the same rate. We expect our kind of 15 percent top line growth to, um, to, uh, to grow. So when you look out, I think our long-term model is, you know, 70%, well, 15% plus CAGR growth on revenue, 70% gross margin. And we think that'll translate down to a 40% adjusted EBITDA number. Sounds good. Um, okay. I guess Ralph, those are my questions. I would see if anybody else has any, uh, any questions, maybe put in the, uh, you know, in the chat or, um, you know, that we could, uh, you know, we, we could ask uh, Ralph while we, we have the time here. Yeah, thanks. If anyone has any questions, um, feel free to put it in chat or or you can DM me, um, some zero um, on here. Um, so do we, do we have any questions on the line for, for Jeff or Ralph? I have a question if they don't. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. So I'm just curious um, for those of you you are on, uh, how, how many of you have uh, been familiar with the sound thinking story? Or is this all new to you? So, so here, here's a question I just got one from DM. Um, can you speak about the recent news about the. Um, about sort of the the comptroller report here in New York, um, and and you know, which mentioned that you guys were had some negative things to say at the at the very least, right, Ralph? Um, um, we talked about that potential wasting of you know resources and you know whatnot. Yeah, I mean that that's uh, it's nonsensical and political, um, and we're gonna. Um... We're going to respond in a very detailed way, similar to the response we had with the uh, the Massachusetts delegations of folks that got finessed by the ACLU to put out the letter to the AG of the Department of Homeland Security. A lot of his conclusions are just dead wrong. So I'll just say the you know the the absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence, um, and um, it's. The idea that because you're not finding a uh, a victim shell casings or anything like that, that a shot didn't occur, and that in fact is a false positive, is just nonsensical. The idea that NYPD would allow themselves to waste their resources on chasing a bunch of false positives from a vendor like us, we wouldn't we wouldn't be doing business with NYPD. It's just that straightforward. So, you know, we we believe this is like him, you know, kind of trying to position himself politically, maybe trying to take a page out of the book of Brandon Johnson's playbook. I think, I think it's fairly well understood and known that he's thinking about running for mayor against Eric Adams. Uh, you probably saw Eric Adams kind of full throated response to his uh, uh, audit report, his audit report, uh, if you will. Um, and even in the addendum, uh, there is a very, um, you know, point by point response bar NYPD is challenging his uh, conclusions. And I mean, in every single regard, 
uh, the only conclusion that they didn't challenge and they they agreed with, and I think we agreed with it too, is that you have to pay your vendors on time. So that's one we actually supported. We thought that was a good, we thought that was a good outcome of his right. uh, report. But everything else is just it just doesn't it doesn't line up and doesn't make sense. So we're we're going to respond um, uh, truthfully. We're also going to respond respectfully because we need to have another narrative out there. Uh, but you know we can't. Um, be too harsh uh because everything i mean we we do a lot of business with uh new york city and uh we just don't want to alienate this person too much because every single contract goes through his office so sure. we have to just be careful so there, there's been rumors about boston and a few other cities considering doing what chicago has done can you can you address that for us ralph uh, sure. Yeah. So maybe uh, maybe you guys haven't seen that there were 11 uh, chiefs of police. We have about 13 deployments in the state of Massachusetts. A 11 of those chiefs in an unprecedented way penned a letter directly to uh, Markey and to Presley and to Warren saying you, your your facts are incorrect. You've been completely misinformed. This is a critical tool. And it's helping us get the gunshot wound victims and save lives and make communities safer. Um, full throated response for there. And there's something that, frankly, they initiated. I mean, so that was really quite encouraging. So, no, I think we're good. We're good in Massachusetts. Um, Boston's moving forward. Michelle Wu, who is, you know, um, I think people describe her as being a somewhat progressive mayor. I mean, she's like kind of my mayor in Oakland, uh, very progressive. She's on board to support her commissioner uh, in using uh, shot spotters. So that's very strong. So their their letter, unfortunately, was um, I think we learned a little bit more about the genesis of it. Um, we think the uh, ACLU uh, maybe finessed the uh, Presley office to get them to put out a letter. And, um, you know, there's been some direct conversations we've had with um, uh I won't say which senator, but a senator out, out of Massachusetts that said, you know, they they really didn't pay attention to what they were signing. I mean, so that's unfortunate. But we do have a follow on meeting with them, uh, with all of the delegations um, in uh, in D.C. We in our response, you probably saw we invited them to come to our ARC uh, or excuse me, our IRC in the Washington, D.C. area. They declined that opportunity, but invited us to come meet with them in their offices. They're also inviting the ACLU, which is perfectly fine. Yep, bring them, and we can tell them where they got it wrong, too. And uh, so we're going to hopefully have that meeting in the next two weeks. Yeah, sorry, sorry to get some questions for in here, Ralph. So can you talk about the possibility of replacing people that do the double check of the, the shots with, with AI? Or you know, why isn't AI sort of doing this already instead of, of people? Yeah, so the AI is letting us kind of keep that uh, cost, I would say, in a semi-fixed state. That's how we're able to get the operating leverage in the mm -hmm. COGS line. I think we very much appreciate the, the uh, level of uh, attention and care that a human reviewer can bring to this that AI can't. So AI, we use it to throttle the noise down to a level so that we can always have humans be able to do that. But importantly... These folks are also doing level one support as well, 24-7, 365. So we talk about them reviewing alerts, but they're also you know, dealing with, hey, I forgot my password. I need to log in. And that's part of the reason we get such high marks on MPS, because there's not a lot of public safety solution companies that are resource like that. Right. Um, shifting over to SafePoint, um, are there any ongoing efforts to target airports and other connectivity stations like train, bus stations? Um, this seems like a natural market segment. Um, are there any regulatory hurdles that you guys face there? Uh, no regulatory hurdles that I'm aware of. Um, I think there is a possibility for us to um, potentially explore uh, something in the uh, public transportation space. And I think that's all I can say right there, but okay. it, it's pretty encouraging. Great. Um, one last question here. Do you find that your Bay Area location gives you a tech advantage? Hmm. Um, yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, sure. I think, you know, the original founding team kind of came out of the Bay Area. I think that's that's pretty uh, that's pretty interesting. Um, yeah. Although we're we're a fairly dispersed organization. We're now grown up to 
over 300 employees. I was employee uh, 25 back in 2010. And uh, uh, that was kind of the core team. And now we've grown it to over 300. We're in locations like um, uh, um, Tucson, uh, Arizona. We're in Washington, D.C. We're in Orlando. And we're also in uh, New York, New Jersey through our uh, technologic uh, division that's doing the work with NYPD. Yeah. Right. Um, are you exploring the? Sorry, did you kind of say something else? I just had one uh, one last one for me. Just talking about um, Ralph. Maybe talk about the SLAs that you guys have in place with you know with your shot spotter customers and you know how how you've been doing with those over time. Yeah, we've been doing great. So um, we're now at 90% detection rate, quality rate, if you will. And if we go below that, uh, we owe some financial penalties. We get penalized financially uh, to that. Um, we have paid out some penalties um, where we've fallen below that expectation of 90%. I will say it was uh, in one borough in uh, New York City. Um, but that we're going to put that in the letter we send back to the controller, to let them know that we, we hold ourselves accountable for a very high standard across the board. We're at 97%. Um, but there has been a month or two where we had some challenges in, um, um, upper Manhattan. That was just a, giving us a devil of a time, uh, because of the noise, the building density, and just a lot of stuff. So we had to really go through and try to figure that thing out. Um, but, um, that's, that wasn't a big, it wasn't a big deal, but it does show that we're holding ourselves accountable to the right. SLA standard. And then one last question here on safe point. Are you guys exploring the installation of, of it in public or private schools? No, schools aren't really our thing. Um, because, uh, I think it's really important. Uh, we're, and I didn't talk about our customer success organization. We really try to uh, be problem solvers and not transactional salespeople. So we're not interested in selling something that isn't value or used appropriately. And then it gets ripped out two to three years later. And I think with schools, you have to ask yourself the question, how well resourced are they to deal with the alerts that they do get? And if they're not organized like that from a resource point of view, from a management process point of view, that's not a customer that we want to that we want to rock with because that's not a long, that's not a long term greedy uh, play for us. We think there's plenty of opportunities in, um, you know, the, the casino market, the uh, healthcare market and even the corporate market. We think that can keep us busy for a very, very long time. But schools wouldn't really be our wouldn't be our thing. In fact, what we said is we're not having any outreach to schools. If people want to come to us and then sell us on why they think we should work with them, we're kind of open to that, but we're pretty, we're pretty picky.